Chapter 11 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape. Chapter 11 On the Ice Fields of Nadia. Bronth the Italian left footprints in the snow. Otherwise, Bronth was invisible. But if a hidden observer watched the Italian's slow progress across the ice fields of Nadia, he would see where the ice was soft, or where snow had fallen during the night into gullies, the unexpected, mysterious appearance of footprints. A left staggered after a right, then another left, then a right again, then a left. Actually, Bront the Italian was not invisible but like all Italians, he was a chameleon of a man. Within seconds his skin would assume the color of its environment, utterly and completely. Thus, from above, Bront the Italian was the dazzling white of the Nadian ice fields. From below, looking up at the pale, cloudless sky, he was cold, transparent blue. All morning he had been trailing the girl. He had reached her camp on the road to Nadia only moments after she had quit it in company with an old man. From the tattered snow cloaks they wore, they both clearly were wayfarers. Bronth could have challenged them at once, sprinting across the ice toward them, but he hadn't done that. Bronth the Italian was a coward. He accepted the fact objectively. His people were notorious cowards. The proper time would come, he told himself. There would come a time when the girl and the old man were helpless. Then he, Bronth, would strike. The day before, an Iberian warrior had given him a description of the girl and had promised him a bag of gold for her capture, half a bag of gold if he killed her and could prove it. A bag of gold, he thought. He would take her alive. It was a long, cold road to Nadia City. True, Bront the Italian was of small stature, a puny creature like all his people. And there were certain disadvantages in his perfect camouflage. He was walking naked across the ice fields in order to remain unseen. His flesh shivered and his bones were stiff. But a Nadian boy named Luluki, whom Bront had promised half the gold, was not many minutes' march behind him with warm clothing, food, and drink, after he captured the girl. Invisible, he mounted a rise where solid sheet ice adhered to the shoulder of a rocky hill. Below him, traversing a snow-floored valley and so far away that they were mere dots against the snow, were the old man and the girl. Bront the Italian chuckled. The sound was swept up instantly and dispersed by the wind. It was a cold wind, and it all but froze Bronth to the marrow, but the Nadian sun was surprisingly warm and now seemed to beam down on him with promise of his golden reward. Shivering both from cold and delight, the invisible Italian walked swiftly down into the snow-mantled valley. There would be a trail of footprints for the boy Luluki to follow. Cold, Hemeth? Ilya asked her companion. No, girl, I'll manage if you will. Is it much further? Half a day's march to Nadia City yet, I'm afraid, Ilya said. We could rest if you wish. The man was extremely old by Tarthian standards, probably three hundred and fifty years old. He wore a snow cape of perillion fur which the wind whipped about his bony frame and up over his completely bald head. "'I'm sorry, Ilya,' he said suddenly. There were tears in his eyes which the cold and the wind did not explain. "'What for? You came to the cave. You accompanied me here to Nadia.' "'When Retok the Iberian almost killed the white god, I fled with the others.' If you didn't flee, you too might have been slain, Hamath. Yet you remain behind. He still lived. Someone had to tend him. Hamath's breath came in shallow gasps. He once had been a strong, big man, but the life and the strength had fled his frame, 
when Retok destroyed Ofrid a hundred years before. As a wayfarer on the plains of Ofrid, he had aged in those hundred years, and he had shrunk and shriveled with approaching senility. "'Tell me, Ilya,' he asked, panting, "'is this Bram Forest you speak of indeed the—the the god of the legend, the god of the tower come to right the ancient wrongs?' A frown marred the beauty of Ilya's matchless face. "'At first, she said with a faraway look in her lovely eyes, at first I thought he was. Hadn't he come suddenly from nowhere at the ordained moment? But then, when he did not slay Retok, when instead he allowed Retok the use of his whip-sword and was almost slain by Retok, when he bled like any mortal, when he—' All at once Illy was blushing. "'What is it, child?' Hamath asked. "'Nothing. It is nothing.' Ilya, you were the infant daughter of a lady-in-waiting in the royal court of Ofrid. I was a captain of the Queen's guards. When Retok's legions brought their death and destruction, I fled to the wilderness with you. I raised you from infancy. I—' The old man's eyes clouded over with emotion. "'You have no secrets from me, child.' Ilya was still blushing, but a serene smile replaced the frown on her face. "'Very well, Father Hamath, I will tell you. There in the cave, as I nursed the stranger back to health, as he grew stronger and could move about, as we conversed and came to know each other, I—I I desired him.' Hamath said nothing. His face was stern. Please, said Ilya, laughing now that her secret was out. It wasn't the kind of desire that could make me a candidate for the golden ape, but I desired him. It was a pure, sweet emotion, such as I have never felt before. I wanted him. I wanted to serve him. I wanted to spend my life helping him and Hamath, Father Hamath, loving him. There, I have said it. Hamath only muttered. They plodded on through the snow, which here was deep and powdery, so they floundered sometimes to their knees. But a girl shouldn't feel such desire for a god, so I told myself he was mortal. Abruptly, and for no reason that Hamath could fathom, Ilya began to cry. What is it, child? What is it? He, he fled. He had lost much blood, and he was weak, yes, but he didn't even stay to protect me. He fled from Retok. Is that a god? Is that even a man who can bring retribution to Retok? Is it, Hamath? Is it? Yet you are taking the road to Nadia, even as legend says the white god will take the road to Nadia. Nonsense! said Ilya, wiping away her tears. Someone has to tell the Nadians what really happened to poor Jlomek, that's all. Retok, Retok will have them eating off his hand. He'll have them believing whatever he says. They'll never know that he killed a prince of their royal blood. But what can Bontark of Nadia, or anyone, do against the power of Retok's abarians? The white god could. Ah, you see. Then perhaps you do believe, after all. The white god, or whoever he was, said Ilya coldly, fled a coward from Retok. She pouted. And yet, and yet he seemed so confused. Perhaps he fled so that the Ophridians might live again in the pride of their greatness, Hamath declared with vehemence. You believe, don't you, Father Hamath? Ilya asked simply. I want to believe, child. You're panting so. You're tired. We'll have to stop and rest. They were traversing the deepest part of the valley, where the Nadian wind, funneling through between the hills flanking the depression, 
had piled the snow into drifts twice the height of a man. They hunkered down in the lee of one of the snow drifts, where the wind could not reach them. With stiff fingers, Ilya withdrew strips of jerked stag meat from the inside pocket of her snow cloak, sharing them with Hamath. They munched the tough, cold meat. Ilya looking at the old man with tenderness and affection. Her foster father, he had been the only parent she had ever known. She closed her eyes and for a moment thought back over the years they had spent as wayfarers on the Ophridian plain, the years dreaming of revenge and succor which would never come, the years... Ilya! Ilya! Father Hamath was calling her name urgently. She shook herself from her reverie. They were seated with their backs to one of the great snowdrifts, where it fell off suddenly like a suspended, frozen sea wave. With a trembling hand, Hamath was pointing before him, out across the ice fields. There, in the soft snow which mantled the ice of Nadia to a depth of only a few inches, were footprints. They were not old prints, deposited there when some wayfarer had passed. Incredibly, they were being made even as Hamath and Ilya watched, as if by some creature with no palpable existence. The icy wind seemed intensified. It, it's coming toward us, Hamath said, his voice a croaking whisper. Ilya knew that he was afraid again. Somehow, with the advancing years, the steel and fire had gone from Hamath's heart. Or perhaps, she thought in sympathy, the terrible defeat and destruction of Ofrid a hundred years ago had done this to him had turned one of the queen's proven champions into an aging, craven wayfarer. "'We'll have to flee,' Hamath said breathlessly. Behind them was the frozen wave of snow. To the right, far away across the snows, a barrier and the plains of Ofred. To the left, not half a day's journey, Nadia City. Ahead of them, the advancing footprints. "'Your whipsword!' Ilya cried, quickly. I carry it, but I can't use it now, Hamath protested. I'm an old man, Ilya, an old man. Then let me have it. You? But you're just a girl. You couldn't. Don't you see, Father Hamath? It's only a man, an Italian. It can't be anything else. If he comes in peace, well enough. Otherwise, here. Give me that sword. But Hamath shook his head with unexpected pride and pulled the weapon from its scabbard. Just then the footprints became wider spaced and appeared more quickly in the snow. The invisible Utalian was running toward them. Awkward, cursing at his own impotence, Hamath fumbled with his weapon. You who call yourself Bram Forrest, Ilya thought, white god or whatever you are, Help us, help us. Then she hated herself for the unbidden thought. Bram Forrest had deserted her once, hadn't he, after she had saved his life? What help could she expect from a man like Bram Forrest? Or was Father Hamath right? Perhaps Bram Forrest had fled so that Ofrid might one day live again to see the wrath of the gods fall on Retok and his Arbarians. Or, Ilya thought with an abrupt flash of insight, perhaps Bram Forrest's flight had been out of his control. Perhaps he was as yet a pawn in a game he barely understood. Bram Forrest, we need you! The running footprints were almost upon them. End of chapter 11